Great. <clears throat> Thanks, Anna and John. So we'll go over uh, gastric electrical stimulation, or GES, which is what we'll refer it to from here on out. Um, indications, the mechanism, um, the implantation of the device, and then results that we have. So this is a, a humanitarian use device designated, um, which means that it's a medical device that's intended for uh, patients that um, are affected, um, less than 8,000 individuals per year. Um, and then it has a humanitarian device exemption, uh, which exempts it from the usual FDA effectiveness requirements. And this is largely due to the inability to accumulate uh, large groups of uh, patients to, to meet FDA standards. Any device with a humanitarian device exemption requires an IRB approval to use it for the approved indication. And the approved indication, um, as summarized by the FDA, is uh, for the treatment of chronic intractable, drug refractory nausea and vomiting secondary to gastroparesis of diabetic or idiopathic etiology. So as we've seen, gastric motility is pretty complex and um, there's a variety of factors, not just uh, peristalsis within the antrum that are gonna affect the gastric emptying. Um, there's receptive relaxation, fundic contraction, uh, the pyloric function, and it's way more complex than just peristalsis. And it's mediated by a variety of factors. There's smooth muscle, the myenteric plexus, uh, the interstitial cells, um, autonomic inputs, and then a variety of gut hormones that haven't been fully worked out yet. So, this gets back to what John Fang had mentioned earlier. We don't totally understand this. Um, we know that there are histologic changes when we do full thickness biopsies of the stomach. Um, those are listed there, some of them that you see. Not everyone with gastroparesis has these. There's definitely been uh, electrical activity changes that are measured in gastroparetic patients. Um, and then people have variability in the severity and the type of symptoms that they have and none of these seem to correlate. So you can't use these for, diag at least right now, we can't use these for diagnosis or to um, track uh, response to treatment. So what's a better way to treat something that we don't understand than with a device that we don't totally understand? So gastric pacemaker is not what this is. So we're not pacing the stomach. Our the goal of this therapy is uh, not to resume contraction. Um, gastric pacing would require high energy, um, so high that you would need an external energy device. You couldn't do it with an implantable battery pack. Um, so from a functional standpoint, it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, and then there's great difficulty in placing the leads for this because if you get them in the wrong spot, you're gonna induce contractions heading in all directions from one point. And so they'll cause contraction heading um, proximally as well. So this, this is not what we're doing. It's not a gastric pacemaker. Um, we're not pacing the stomach. And this is not currently used in the clinical setting, um, but is being studied in animal studies. So what then is gastric electrical stimulation? or neurostimulation. This uses low energy. Uh, the energy is so low, it does not induce contractions. Um, it's high frequency, so much higher frequency than you would see um, for stomach contractions. And um, it's, uh, it does not um, cause contractions, so gastric emptying isn't expected to be reliably improved. Now, a lot of studies will uh, track gastric emptying after implantation of this device. And although some of them show uh, some improvement in emptying, no one has shown that it's associated with improved outcomes, meaning some patients will have great symptomatic response and no change in gastric emptying. Some patients will have uh, no clinical response and improvements in their gastric emptying. So it doesn't, it doesn't seem to correlate. And, and so that's not the goal of neurostimulation. It also does not correct motility dysrhythmias. So what does it do then? 
the things that we've figured out by PET uh, scans, spectral analysis, and uh, functional MRI studies, um, we've found that there's increased afferent vagal activity, so going back to the CNS, and then there's increased thalamic caudate and amygdala activation. So what we think is going on is that this signal, um, this electrical signal is influencing the central nervous controls of nausea and vomiting so that patients are um, perceiving less nausea and having the, uh, the vomiting center impacted by these electrical stimuli. So how do we implant it? Um, it's generally done laparoscopic. Um, the leads, there's two of them. They're implanted on the greater curve, 10 centimeters from the pylorus, one centimeter apart. The battery pack is implanted in a subcutaneous pocket. Um, you do an upper endoscopy to make sure that you haven't uh, violated the mucosa. And then it's usually, an, for us at least, an overnight hospital stay. And then the device is turned on at the time of surgery on the lowest settings. And then we generally don't do any adjustments for six weeks. The patients often go on to some narcotics right after surgery uh, for pain control. They may have ileus. They may have worsening of their gastroparetic symptoms after a general anesthesia. So we really wait several weeks for that post-operative recovery before we start managing the the device. This is the first double-blind crossover study, the one that resulted in the FDA um, humanitarian device approval. Um, I apologize to the authors. I made this. It would certainly never have made publication in their paper, but I hope, I hope it'll get to the point of what they did. So they had 33 patients. Um, all of them had a stimulator implanted and then they immediately went, were randomized to either on or off. At one month, they switched them, so those who had it off had it turned on, and those who had it on had it turned off. They did that for a month, and then after that two-month period, which was the phase one, everyone, everyone's device got turned on, and they knew it was turned on. So what were the results? During the blinded section, the on versus off blinded portion, there was a 50% decrease in weekly vomiting frequency for those who had the device on. However, total symptom scores were unchanged. Um, Health-related quality of life was unchanged. And then if you looked at subgroup analysis, both diabetic and idiopathic individually, there were no changes whatsoever uh, between the on period and the off period. When it got to the open label portion where all devices were on and everyone knew it, weekly vomiting frequency decreased by 72% compared to baseline. Uh, total symptom scores significantly improved uh, and health-related quality of life significantly improved. And then if they compared the open label on period to the off period, uh, weekly vomiting frequency also improved. So some mixed results there, especially during the blinded portion of the study. These two subsequent studies tried to do a little bit different design. Um, one was done in diabetics and one in only idiopathics. And both of these were identical in design. With this one, instead of randomizing right after implantation, they underwent a one and a half month period of having the device on, everybody, and everybody knew it. And that was to try and get them through this post-operative period. And then they got randomized to either on or off. And they had a longer period in each category before they did the crossover. And this portion of the study was blinded. So they didn't know if they were on or off. And then they got switched at another three months. And then they did another um, open label period where everyone's device was turned on. So this also had some mixed results. You can see here that people's baseline uh, weekly vomiting frequency was very high. And then after the device got implanted and it was on and everybody knew it, there was dramatic improvement in both idiopathic and um, diabetic. However, when they went through this blinded period of on versus off, there was no difference. So during the blinding, on didn't matter versus off. And then when they went through the open label period, again, they were still much better than baseline. Now, the meta-analyses 
of all these smaller studies. All these smaller studies are open label and there's like these, these randomized ones, there's significant improvement in symptoms of nausea and vomiting, um, but those are all open label. So this is brought in, there's a lot of people who question whether there's a dramatic placebo effect because during the blinded portions of these, um, there really is not a, a significant difference. So we've gone on to measure some other objective measures to see if we can get to the bottom of whether this is helping or not. People have measured healthcare resource utilization and found that there's reduced hospitalizations, uh, hospital days, um, ED visits compared to pharmacotherapy, and then there's a reduction of healthcare costs. And one study showed that uh, gastric uh, electrical stimulation was cost effective after a two year period compared to pharmacotherapy. Um, there's uh, a fair amount of data showing reduction of the need for enteral and parenteral nutritional support. 78% were able to eliminate nutritional support needs um, on meta-analysis, and then uh, one later study, 90% eliminated the need for enteral feeding after gastro gastric electrical stimulation. Improved glycemic control um, with the ability to not go through periods where their uh, eating habits are irregular and they're vomiting. Um, with hemoglobin A1C or glycohemoglobin levels improving um, even after three years. But there are also complications to device placement. And you can see the list of uh, different things that can go on, um, including treatment failures and the patient wanting uh, the device out for that. And that's somewhere between 8 and 15 percent. So we've also looked at predictive factors for a favorable response, and it's pretty clear that diabetics respond uh, more favorably than idiopathic gastroparetic patients, and that symptoms of nausea and vomiting um, are much more responsive than other symptoms, especially pain, um, which generally is not uh, as responsive, especially in an idiopathic patient. And then if the patient is Really, they should really be free of narcotic pain medication at the time of implantation because that's a negative predictive factor as well. So how do I put all this together and what do I tell the patients? So really the goal of stimulation or neurostimulation is to reduce the frequency and severity of nausea and vomiting um, and to reduce their healthcare utilization. A lot of these patients um, are going to the ER a lot or getting admitted. Um, and then certainly if they have TPN or a feeding tube, um, there's, there's a good shot at getting rid of those. It's not a cure, um, and there's definitely non-responders and poor responders, and I tell the patients that. We don't have a great selection process. Um, and I tell them that if the, the, any of their pain symptoms will not improve. Um, granted, some of them do, but I tell them all that it's not going to happen, and they shouldn't expect that. And then we talk about the risks and complications. So in summary, um, the mechanism is poorly understood, but it's likely centrally acting through vagal afferents. Um, open label studies show significant improving in nausea, improvement in nausea and vomiting, um, but there is some debate about the placebo effect. Um, the data is pretty clear on improvement of um, uh, symptoms in open label trials reduction of healthcare costs, um, and re reduction of uh, support, nutritional support needs. So um, in these patients who are high healthcare utilizers, um, they've been through all the medical management options, um, feeding tube dependent. These are people that um, are, I feel like are good candidates to have this um, because if it does work in helping some of these items, um, it's definitely a worthwhile endeavor. Thank you.